how do you know when someone is using RxJS observables? They will tell you, okay? So you don't need to ask them, and I use observables everywhere, and I use them for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and you know, I am responsible for the streams with dollar signs, so if you hate those, hate me, okay? So last year, I was here as well. Who was here last year? Okay, kind of like good amount. Um, so, do you remember this? Last year, I kind of compared React to a horse and Cycle to a car. So, I need to apologize because, you know, React is a good thing, but I'm not a serious person. And everybody's so excited about React. And I'm just like, you know, what is, what is there to be? Excited about, um, so I kind of feel like you know, just <laughs> what is going on here. Yeah. But so last year I also finished the talk by saying that oh, there's this like visualization of stuff, and if I have time, then I'm gonna build this dev tools where you can visualize stuff. So it turned out that. Uh, we had uh, in Copenhagen this year this thing called PsychoConf. Uh, it was like around 50 people or something. And we had their Yanni and we had Edward and their city over there. And we had people from New Zealand and from San Francisco. We had talks and we had also hack sessions. And I got together with this guy called Sam Turan. And we hacked on the dev tools that visualize the, the data flow. And we, after that, we just improved it, and that's what this talk is about. So I'm going to show what this is about. And I'm actually just going to dive straight into it and just show you the thing, okay, without more introduction. So here's a bug that I found. This bug is in the framework, actually. So you click on the button. Only that button should become red. So someone submitted to me this small reproducible bug case. and. Uh, so I was curious, like, why is this bugging? So then I just, oh, and first notice that it's a recursive structure. So the same component is inside itself multiple times, different instances of that component. So when we open the dev tools, we see there that, you know, the recursive structure is visualized as well, right? And we can also interact with the app, and that will sort of, like, zap some events there showing the data flowing. So that's a bit too fast. Let's put it a little bit in slow motion. So then when I click, only one of those uh, DOM first uh, things should do, but that one should not happen. And also, that one should also not happen. So then I knew, like, man, that's where the bug is. So I, I visualized the bug, actually. And then I knew that that second DOM node should not have fired, and I knew where to look into the code. And that's what this is all about. So to me, it's not about just visualizing something. Uh, it's a lot about answering this question here, okay? So sometimes you hit a bug, you want to know why is it behaving like this, okay? Or let's say you join a new project and you want to know how does this thing work because it's so complex. So one of the tools that we have for that is, is the debugger. So you open the debugger and start checking line by line, okay, how is this going? And then it goes to a different stack of functions and now, okay, there's that function, which is called that function. and there's all these local variables, and there's the variables from the scope, and like soon you're like, mm, and it's like very hard to follow, but it's very important, okay? Um, how many of you have like dug into the React library with a debugger, maybe? Yeah, you know, this is important to do. So those of you who haven't done that, it's important, because sometimes when you hit a bug or you have a performance issue, you need to know what's going on. So it's important to understand this crazy machinery that we have almost for any program, OK? So the debugger helps for that. It gives you micro-level information, uh, very specific stuff. But it doesn't help you get the big picture of your program. And sometimes that's what you want in like a short amount of time. So it's kind of like if I show you this piece of the jigsaw puzzle, then do you know what this is about, like the whole picture? Not yet. Well, that's one micro-level information. If I show you another piece, then it's the same drawing still, but mm, no, it's just micro-level information. But the big picture is this, okay? And 
that's you know the best uh, for a glance. So what the debugger gives you is a bunch of small micro level information that you need to put together in order to understand this stuff. Okay, so every time you stare at the debugger, trying to understand how this whole stuff works, you're building the so-called mental model of your program. Okay, and this takes a lot of energy and stresses us out. So sometimes you're just like, hmm, hmm, and you know, and your boss pokes you on your shoulder and is like, what are you humming about? This is not a meditation class. Work, you know. And by the way, if you have a boss like that, you just change job. Okay, just change. So what tools do we have for macro level debugging? Okay, stuff on the big picture. Let's take a look what is there. Um, well, the minimap in Sublime Editor, right? That kind of like, what does it tell you? It tells you that mm, you have a lot of lines of code or you have few lines of code. I mean, it will never tell you that some bug is happening, right? It's just kind of interesting. Uh, in the past, we had UML diagrams. Yeah. Um, so we had all kinds of UML diagrams. Some of them are very useful. So the, like the sequence diagram, we saw in this conference already, someone showed that uh, how the threads in React Native communicate with each other. Very useful to use this for that. Uh, but then others, like the class hierarchy diagram, you know, it's for Java people. And it doesn't really tell you uh, about a bug, okay? It only tells you about how classes are structured. And in the past, we even had tools that would convert from this Java code and from Java code to this. Like, okay, yeah. So in modern front end, okay, this is called React Monocle. And it allows you to see the structure of your React components, the hierarchy of components, and in real time as the props start propagating down, you know, it shows us that as well. So this is really cool, really good, because in a glance you can understand how your whole view works, right? Uh, but as you know, React is not everything. Sometimes we need something for architecture like Redux or something like Flux. So also Redux has this dev tools where it shows the chart of your whole state tree, okay, and that's really nice. Uh, so Redux is nice because it gives you this predefined mental model, okay? You're gonna have this mental model for all your Re Redux apps. And I'm sure you heard about this before. It's always this diagram, it's uh, state in the store goes to the components and props go down and user events, action, Redux, you know, you know, yeah. So we don't even need to visualize the big picture of Redux apps because it's always the same. Except it's not always the same. Okay? So if you have some asynchronous operations, then things start getting quite complicated. Like do you handle async operations with action creators or promises? Then the big picture is different. Or with Redux Saga with those generators, right? Then it's another way. Or maybe with Redux Loop. Nowadays, there's Redux Observable and also Redux Ship, which is very scalable. And then we also have people who mix both sagas and action creators with promises inside them. Um, so you get to, so do not raise your hand if you do this because this is not nice, okay? This is not nice. So there's a lot of variations inside the idea of Redux and we're getting almost every week some kind of new Redux effects library. So, the devil is in the details, like async is a part that can give us quite buggy behavior sometimes. So that is uh, something that would be nice to visualize, right? So this is what I decided to do. Instead of having a predefined architecture, you know, always the same architecture, I wanted to allow people to do all kinds of variations of their architectures, but I still wanted to have the ability to visualize stuff. So I wanted to, okay, given any program, okay, how do I just, make it possible to see the data flowing through, through this, okay? Not like a debugger, but just in a glance, understand it, okay? And so how do you visualize this stuff? And this is what I found out, that um, you can't. You sort of need to replace control flow with something else that can be visualized. Uh, I don't know if we have anything that is good for in a glance understanding all this if and else and stack trace. So we need to remove normal control flow and put, things, put something else in its place which can be visualized in a glance. And that is reactive streams or anything that looks like data flow. And this includes like RxJS observables or reactive streams in general, okay? Now, people think that streams are very scary. It's like, eh. 
but I don't think it's scary. It's just different. And it actually, it's pretty simple. I gave a presentation in another conference this week, and it's like 30 lines of code, the simplified RxJS. Pretty easy. So today we're going to understand streams and also how they are used in PsychoJS and how it's visualizable. And it's going to be quite straightforward. Okay, I'm not going to use code. Okay, um, going to use this. So that over there is a stage, and it's green. Ah, oh, this stage is green as well. Okay, and outside of the stage, there's the outside world. Okay, and then in the outside world, things happen, like, you know, some car passed by, that's a, an event, right? Anything that happens is an event. Or let's say a blue car passed by, that's an event. And what else do we have in this outside world? We have, like, Mr. Driver, okay? He knows how to drive those cars, but he also knows how to do other stuff. He's just doing stuff. So what happens on the stage there? Uh, we have Julia on stage. Uh, this is how Julia looks like, and Julia just likes to observe the outside world, okay? So whenever she sees something like a blue car, she's like, yay, nice, and she lifts a sign that says plus one, okay? Um, yeah, so she doesn't need to go to the restroom, she doesn't need to sleep, she just stands there. And then we also have Raphael on stage, say hello to Raphael. And uh, so he's also just looking at the outside world. He's observing. Look, I'm using the word observing, okay? Just kind of hinting to you. And Raphael just, whenever he sees a red car passing by, he says minus, he lifts a sign that says minus one. And notice that Julia is like, ah, that's not blue. So then, yeah, they just do this game all the day, one or minus one. And then we also have Monica on stage, and that's how Monica looks like. She seems to have a headset just like I do. And uh, then Monica does not observe the outside world. She observes Julia and Raphael in front of her. Okay? So then whenever they raise a sign, she's going to raise a sign. But her sign will add up all of the numbers that she saw from Julia and Raphael. So she has good memory. She remembers uh, what they raised in the past. So, okay, there... Uh, Raphael raised minus one, and Julia is raising three because probably she saw five from Mon uh, Julia. I'm sorry, I've mixed up the names. Anyway, um, and minus two from Raphael, so she raises three. You get the idea, right? One, 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 minus one, yeah. So, okay, th that's about it. And then there's also Dominic on stage, and this he's not happy today, so whatever. Uh, yeah, and Dominic does not observe cars. Dominic likes to observe Monica. Yeah. So, <laughs> the thing, uh, Dominic just looks at whatever number that she raises, and he just puts, like, div for div. You see what I'm doing here, okay? It's, yeah. So, that's what they do. Like, you know, they raise a sign, raise a sign, raise a sign. And it's very important that they're looking in this direction, okay? Because... As I said, Dominic is interested in Monica, but if they are well, like this way, you know, then things don't work because, okay, Julia wants to see red cars, but how can she like hear a red car passing by? And we can't hear a color, so the car would have to like hit her or, you know, and then what if like then Monica would not react to, and see, I'm using the word react, okay? Um, Monica would not react to Julia because Julia would have to go to Monica and like, yo, it's your turn. Okay? So this is not good because then you get, don't get separation of concerns, okay? Because they are interested in one thing and they can just stay to their thing. So this is good, okay? They do that. But, you know, nothing really happens. They're just raising signs. Nothing concrete is happening. So that's where Mr. Driver comes in and he's also not happy. Um, so he can make things happen. And Mr. Driver is observing Dominic in front of him, okay? And he doesn't care about the others, just about Dominic. So whenever Dominic raises some sign, uh, Mr. Driver will actually build that in the real world. So he goes and puts something there, okay? And then, you know, Raphael raises minus one, Monica raises one four, and div for div, and then the driver builds that in the real world. 
So you see, there's like real stuff happening, like cars passing by, and real stuff being built, but not on the stage, only outside. And they just keep on playing this game the whole day. So it's an, sort of an interplay between this outside world where real stuff happens and just the stage where it's just like a play and people are just moving around, okay? So it's basically the stage is observing the outside world and the outside world is observing the stage and... Like this is the idea of PsychoJS, okay? It's, it's just that, that's where the name comes from. So how would this look like in code, okay? Um, we have the imports, we import some stream library, we import some driver, and then we have the stage, which is where things happen. And then we have the stage gets an argument there, which is events from the outside world, and Julia will sort of get from all of those events from the outside world. She will uh, filter for only blue car, that's what she's interested in, and she will be interested in the events of type click. Oh, actually, let's rename that to pass by. So it's a blue car pass by. And she's going to map those to plus one. And then Raphael will like do almost the same thing, but he's interested in red cars and he's filtering for the events of type pass by and mapping those to minus one. Um, Monica will look get events from both of them and she will sort of map them over time, but with memory, right? So she has their memory over there and she adds that with the number that comes from one of them. And then Dominic just takes Monica's signs and maps those to some div saying some stuff. I also included some buttons there. And then uh, we return that from the stage. Okay, that's what was going, is going to go to the outside world. And then finally, the app looks something like this. You can make a car to pass by and then Monica's memory is displayed there through Dominic. Okay. So how does that work in a glass? We can open the dev tools and you can see that um, the, you know, we can make a car passing by and they raise the signs and the information just zaps between. And we can also have it uh, in slow motion a bit. So there we go. Uh, Monica raises a sign and, uh, no, sorry, Julia and then Monica and then Dominic and it goes to the outside world. Okay, I'm going to do one small trick where I'm going to rename stuff. So instead of stage and events, I'm going to call this main function. That takes sources. Sources are everything from the outside world. And then I'm going to rename Julia to increment stream and rename to Raphael to decrement stream, rename Monica to count stream, and rename Dominic to virtual DOM stream, and return that. And that's how you make a counter application in CycleJS. Okay? So it's the same idea. It's, it's really, really that idea of the stage. Okay, what other kinds of applications could we visualize? Here's another one that just downloads random user data. How does that look like? Here we have two worlds. We have the DOM world and HTTP world. You can think of it as like Earth is DOM and HTTP is space. But it's the same idea that you just observe stuff from space or you give information and space observes you, you know. And that's how we can get data from HTTP. What else? Well, there's also some kind of body mass index calculator, and how does that one work? Uh, we can see that, you know, we can open the dev tools, and then when we apply that, those events zap through, and you can know which part of my program reacts to my inputs. Okay, and you're probably thinking, what about the real world application, okay? Um, so, how would that look like? Would it be thousands of nodes? Maybe, okay, so this stage was rather small, right, for people. But what if we would have a bit bigger stage there with a blue fellow on top and then maybe more people on top of it. But one, one nice idea that we can do is we can just put the green stage on top of the blue stage. Okay? Because then in total, the blue stage is still a stage, right? And then we have Julia and Raphael observing the blue guy in front and then someone at the back observing Dominic. So now we have in total six people. And we could keep on doing this and suddenly we have a huge pyramid, right, with a bunch of stages on top of each other and a lot of people. Um, so that is also an application, right, because the outside world can observe that blue stage. That's cool. So you could reuse any stage inside another stage, right? But now we have six people on that stage, and what if it became a thousand, right? 
But then we can just collapse the whole green stage into one person that has four heads. And then, you know, it's basically we have three people on stage. Okay? But you get the idea is that we can just collapse and expand these stages. And, you know, then you don't need to see a thousand nodes. That's the idea of how we would uh, go about visualizing a real application. And, you know, that's, these are the ideas in PsychoJS. There's not that much more to it than this. Okay? Of course, there's a lot more to learn about, but, you know, you can just check it in that address. So, um, the debugger will have in the future more stuff like expand and collapse, and I still need to know how to support higher order streams, okay? But it works today. I could get a bug report from someone, and I can see how the bug works without actually having to dig into code. And one more thing, I'm going to talk about different ideas and different stuff. Um, so this diagram here, I did not make, okay? Um, someone who read the introduction to reactive programming thought, like, oh, I'm just going to draw this. So I didn't even, like, tell them that they could draw it, okay? But it's, it's, a, it's about the data flow and the, this different type of flow control, okay, can be visualized. It's not so nice to do this with if and else, you know. And also different types of frameworks like Chu. I don't know if you've heard about Chu, but uh, some, someone guy, uh, some guy called uh, Forrest is, is working on this. And there's some visualizations of how the data flow works in Chu, and that's awesome as well. I don't know if you've heard of flow-based programming, but there's something called NoFlow. And going a bit beyond that, there's also this thing called Luna, which is basically a functional programming language. Okay, it's written by Haskellers. They're like core Haskeller people. And it has a monadic I.O. system. It has a bunch of like higher order functions. It's really like functional programming. But it's also visual, so it has like another side to it, which uh, allows you to edit the code either in text or in a visual style. And it's all about data flow and these, these same concepts, okay? And here, um, he's going to sort of get data from a sensor that detects the, the temperature of the water and then sort of turn on some fan. And this is the same, the same concepts, really. And I'd like to finish with this one, which is, you know, I was mentoring a programmer on how to learn PsychoJS at work, and I didn't teach him how to draw the diagrams, but he just did, him, did it himself because the ideas are really the same as, you know, that stage there. So it's not like the programming language is different from those drawing concepts. And that's what I want to enable people to have, like, a big picture of their program. Okay? Thank you for listening. I hope this was enjoyable and also educational. Do we have questions? You, you said asynchronicity is hard, but cancel tokens solve all of those issues with promises. What do you think about that? Dominic. <laughs> okay. Cancel tokens are a very nasty idea. That's what I think about them. Okay. Um, if you think promises are complicated now, a tsunami is arriving, and that tsunami is cancel tokens. Okay. It's very bad. I, uh, I don't think, yeah. Can we use CycleJS with Cycle? Uh, what? Uh, JSX with Cycle. Yes, you can. Uh, what do you think about MobX? Awesome. Okay, so actually, I, when I see a new library and stuff, I, I try to think, hmm, you know, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And with MobX, I was just like, this is a good idea. Okay? It's basically, you have a, the idea of a spreadsheet, okay? And there, you might have other cells that just react to that spreadsheet, and uh, to this other cell, and then you can mutate that cell. So it's a very familiar concept from spreadsheets for programming, and it just works. So I think it's great. Um, how does this approach to visualize the data flow work for large applications? Do you have any examples to show us? Uh, I could show you, but it would just be a bunch of nodes, and it's not like digestible. So before doing that, just need to do the expand collapse. It's like the next thing that we're going to build. Would you recommend RxJS and React Redux project? Uh, well, you know, because Redux already has some data flow, like 
you already get some stuff from Redux, and you can add RxJS. It will add, give you some more benefits, and if you do that, I recommend you use Redux Observable. Uh, so it does add some benefits, I would say, especially for async. Okay? Cycle ununify. Why? Uh, we made this new state management approach called cycle ununify, which is basically um, you like send out reducers from each of those stages. Okay, imagine that one stage would like send out reducers, and then the other stage would also send out reducers, composing what the previous one had. So you're kind of wrapping a reducer and a reducer and a reducer. And this approach worked really well. Why did we do that? Because handling lists with CycleJS was a pain. That was one thing. So I'm kind of honest about the problems. You know, it was a pain. And I tried to do it, uh, something about it. And I used Cycle Unify in an actual project. And I'm really happy about it. Really worked nicely. Um, if Mr. Driver is building, then who's driving? I don't know if you noticed, but there was a, another Lego character, but he didn't have a head. Do you have enough libraries coupled to Cycle to rewrite app regularly? I don't understand this question. Next question. CycleJS dev tool for RxJS. Yeah, we're thinking about it. Actually, one of the really interesting things is that RxJS version 5 uh, was built with an architecture that enables debugability. So Ben Lish has been talking about, you know, oh, if I have time in Netflix, I'm going to build this. So that's pretty cool. But we just need someone to do it. There's some issues, like how to do it exactly. Jafar Hussein has some idea of using like ES6 proxies to sort of like get the metadata from everything. It's sort of possible, but you know, I need to move fast and I need to like focus my work on doing something. Do you prefer RxJS or, or Extreme and why? Um, I usually nowadays use Extreme. Why? Because it's suitable for um, CycleJS. It's sort of, you know, we got rid of operators that we don't need from RxJS. We just used some operators and we made things like uh, with smart defaults. So I mainly do CycleJS, so I use Extreme. Extreme is good for CycleJS. RxJS is more general. It's for anything, and that's when I would use RxJS. Do you also see that it's basically programming the way you would design electronic circuit and also like programming Max MSP? Yeah, there's a lot of ideas shared from circuits, definitely. And this idea of flow programming, you know, is highly related also to, let's say, uh, machine learning. So TensorFlow also has their networks of like machine learning and neural, neural networks. So there's a lot of correlations between this stuff. Um, is CycleJS used in production for any projects? Yes, I used it in some projects and also Danske Bank, which is a Danish bank in uh, Copenhagen. They were one of the main sponsors of CycleConf and I visited their team. They have a team of 14 developers building an application with CycleJS and they actually did like a thorough study like which frameworks should we use and stuff and for their use case they were like, yes, we want to use CycleJS. So yeah. How long have you planned with Lego before this presentation? Great presentation, but, uh, ooh, oh, ah, okay, yes, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, how long have I played with Lego? I, I really played a lot with Lego when I was a kid, but for this presentation, I probably did like six hours. Uh, yeah, the, the, the hard part was just getting, yeah. The hard part was just getting people's Heads, you know, I was really like, mm, this head doesn't work with that head. So, yeah. Is CycleJS used in production for any projects? Yes. What do you think of Redux Observables? Yes. Uh, do you consider an option teaching five year old children programming? That's a cool question. Um, in Futurize in Finland, where I work, we have a, a thing where we teach kids in schools and also outside of schools and stuff. Maybe, yeah. Actually, there's a good uh, Google project. I should have put it on the extras called something. I think it's blocks, something like that, which uses the idea of nodes connected to each other and data flow between them. And that's awesome because kids just get that. And they're like, oh, I get this piece. I cl plug that to that. It's pretty cool. I should have put it in the extras. Would it be possible to have such visualization with Redux Observable or Mob X? I don't know, maybe. But look, one of the things is uh, I wrote a blog post about everywhereness as a foundation. And the idea is that once you have the same pattern everywhere, then it becomes a foundation on which you can build stuff on top. So for instance, with Redux, 
uh, you have to write everything as a reducer, like all the state transitions as reducers, right? So that gives you a guarantee that all of the state will be uh, transitioned with reducers, which are pure. And what guarantee does that give you? Debuggability with the dev tools and uh, all kinds of time traveling, all that kind of stuff, right? So if you have just one thing which is mut mutating state in re Redux, your dev tools won't be that accurate anymore. So you know what I mean? So um, I'm not sure if like Redux Observable plus those other things will have that foundation to make it possible to visualize the data flow. But the idea with PsychoJS is that, you know, everything is a stream, so we have that foundation there as a guarantee. An advantage of React Redux over Cycle. It's easy for you to do this and a name in the middle. You know what I mean? Like, um, basically making a component as you know it and put it in angle brackets and using that in a virtual DOM tree. So sometimes in CycleJS we do like a combined latest of different streams of virtual DOM nodes and then some people in our chat are asking like how can I just put like this, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. How many functional languages have you used before building Cycle? I am not like a, I don't have a background of functional languages but uh, I am studying currently Haskell, reading the Haskell book already, in like chapter many. And um, I played a lot with Elm. So actually last year um, in this conference, I was with my friend uh, who knows Elm a lot and we decided to start hacking on Elm native UI, which is basically React Native plus Elm. So I also helped hacking some Elm there. And I have background also with Prolog. I don't know if that's a functional language, but it's a pro logic language. What do you think about the approach Angular? Uh, 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 what, what do you think about the approach Angular has with RxJS? Very interesting. Uh, Victor wrote a blog post about the tax taxonomy of reactive programming. Um, it's really interesting to think like why use some types of reactive programming versus the others. Like, MobX is a different type of functional uh, reactive programming. So they use something that looks like MobX in some places, something that looks like, well, they use RxJS in other places. Very interesting. I, I really don't know what to think about Angular 2. It's such an interesting piece. Stickers, I forgot them at home. When should one prefer CSP over Rx? When you're doing something in the back end and you need back pressure. I'm, I, don't, I don't do back end, I do front end. Is the stage a pure function? Yes, you got the idea. Uh, when should one, uh, I'm answering so fast, yeah. Would you use Psycho just for not that complex apps with small amount of async stuff? Yes, the thing is like my, bra my brain is now like permanently damaged with PsychoJS, so if I start any project, I just do it with PsychoJS. For what kind of project would you recommend PsychoJS? The best use case is, uh, dashboard, so you have a lot of data coming from a lot of places, like let's say, you know, web sockets or some kind of REST API and then some kind of weird sensor with like Raspberry Pi. And dashboards work really well, but in general, you know, you can build any front-end app with Elm, you can build any front-end app with Cycle, you can build any front-end app with React or Angular, you get the idea, but of course, I mean, it, it's not that it's just for dashboards, but it works best in dashboards. Is the visualization the only benefit of PsychoJS? No. Um, there, there's a lot of other benefits, like testability, because everything is uh, like in the, the stage is a function, then you don't need to do aggressive mocking, actually. No global mockings. You just need to feed an input and check what is the output. That's always your approach. It's really nice. There are other advantages. What do you think about functional languages compiled to JS? Awesome. Like PureScript and Elm, Double awesome, we should really like learn this stuff, okay? It's not that hard. Elm is actually very easy. It's just the syntax, it's like in the beginning you're like, what is this? But it's after a while it's like, man, this is so much easier than anything that I've ever programmed before. How NoFlow compares to Rx? Uh, NoFlow is a flow-based uh, editor and you just build the node directly and you drag it, so it's only visual, as far as I know. And Rx is a library that is only code, textual. And also Rx has the other thing that you can have observables of observables. And I don't think you can do that with no flow, which means it's a static data flow graph. What about performance benchmarks in CycleJS? 
Boom. So last year someone asked this and it was uh, quite slow. And then someone else made a benchmark uh, about rendering and updating. I know that there's all kinds of different types of uh, performance up, uh, benchmarks. And CycleJS is actually faster than Angular 2 and faster than React. And it's in the league of the fastest. Yeah. Thanks to SnapDOM, which is the virtual DOM library that we use, and also Xtreme, which is the fastest stream library. Should I stop? Yeah, you should stop. You're done. Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we have to. Uh... Oh.